will be looking at contemporary art and the immediate world that shaped it, what we often consider to be at this point in time, the postmodern world. This is a great time for us to recognize that history is being written as we are currently living it. And many perspectives are going to change from today to tomorrow to further down in the future. So it can be a bit tricky for us to unpack what is currently going on in the art world and what is going to leave a lasting impact. Bearing that in mind then, and given what you know about modernity from our last lesson, what do you think then that post-modernity or contemporary art might be about. And as I just said, we are today going to focus mainly on the art of the present day, but I'm going to start us back in the 1980s just to lay a little bit of foundation of what has been going on in the time immediately building up to our current artworks. Artists of the 80s have often been called postmodernist because they are what is considered to be the first real movement to aggressively reject the ideals of modernity, but it's not really quite true. Many movements prior to what we call postmodernity vary in degrees of rejecting modern philosophies and aesthetics prior to that. And in calling this movement postmodern, we may actually be giving way too much credit to the relationship between the modernist ethos and work of the 80s. Jeff Koons, the most financially successful living artist of all time, was really more influenced by pop art than he was by modernity, as you can see in especially his earlier pieces like this one, Michael Jackson and Bubbles. Koons rejects the elitism of the fine art world, the language of art that is difficult to appreciate without an academic background. Instead, Koons chooses to work with aesthetics that are pleasing in popular culture, things that a wide audience is likely to appreciate. This can be considered to be a reconciling of high and low art. So art that is made for museums and galleries and critical contemplation, and art that is made to please the masses. Critics will accuse him of pandering, of dumbing down fine art to cater to the plebeians, and they will also call him a commercially minded sellout. And it is true that his work regularly sells in auctions for millions of dollars, and Coons is definitely an incredibly savvy businessman, having essentially created a massively lucrative brand based on his works and his name. And leveled with similar accusations of non-artistic intentions is British artist Damien Hirst. It's very interesting, this relationship between artists and money. Art is consistently proven to be the most valuable commodity in the world and invariably increases in value over time, but it's still a taboo for artists to openly and actively treat the making of art as a business venture rather than a calling born of passion. In response, Hearst will often shoot criticism right back at the art world with his irony-laden pieces. Often over the top and exaggerated, Hearst exposes the absurdities of the art world. Asked by a friend, for the love of God, Damien, what will you do next? He was inspired to cast a skull in platinum and encrust it with millions of British pounds worth of diamonds, making it the single most expensive, and some would say ridiculous, piece of art in the world. Hearst often takes the things that have made people angry about art since modernity, that it doesn't require skills, that it doesn't value aesthetics, and then he makes a joke of it. He is fully aware that these pieces could be done by anyone, that he can literally display a blank canvas with a set of unopened paints, and if the art world accepts it, people will go to see it, and on top of that, pay exorbitant amounts of money for it even when some of his exhibitions have been accidentally mistaken for trash by the janitors and swept up into the rubbish bins overnight. The reaction itself is part of the critique that he is making, and therefore part of the art. So those are two people who laid a lot of the groundwork for contemporary art and are generally recognized as two of the most famous faces even in today's art world. 
Now, contemporary artists are affected by many things, and any list that I create is going to be inadequate when it comes to fully exploring those ideas that are important to artists of today. But we are going to now look at some common major themes that are likely to be factors that will come into play when people in the future categorize contemporary art. And those are globalization, the role of the audience and participation, environmental issues, appropriation, and the functioning of high and low art. Let's first look at globalization. As access to the world expands and we are exposed constantly to a multitude of cultures, it becomes very difficult for an audience to speak to a universal experience that can be broadly applied to all peoples and groups as we saw modernists trying to do. Rather, contemporary art is often deeply personal and many artists draw on their unique individual backgrounds as points, not merely to embrace their cultural or personal heritage, but to use that background as a lens to examine the world. In her installation Mirror Woman, Kim Soo Ja, a South Korean artist, draws on the relationship that we have learned about between textiles and the nomadic lifestyle. In this installation, she creates a maze from these large squares of fabric so the audience can relate to her feelings of displacement as she is moved from place to place never feeling like she has had a personal home. Artists will also address concerns about how minority cultures are treated. In this performance, two artists dressed as stereotypical quote-unquote native peoples in exotic costume from a land that they actually made up and toured several countries in a cage as a protest to the treatment of smaller people groups as quote-unquote subhuman. Interestingly, because this was in a public space, the artists were approached by many people who did not know the nature of their performance and therefore actually wound up treating them much like exhibits in a zoo, taking pictures, posing with, and even trying to feed them bananas. And what this does is this actually reveals to us more about the audience than it does about the artists. Many artists rely on the audience's participation to complete the ideas of their work. This can be called social practice art. In Rurikrit Chiranyeva's Soup No Soup, when the audience entered the gallery space, they had no objects to look at on the walls or on podiums. Nothing was there for them to interact with. Instead, Chiranyeva cooked and served each person a bowl of soup. And you may be asking yourself, What makes this action different from being a chef in a restaurant? Imagine you come into a gallery space expecting to look at art, but instead of looking at something, you are given a bowl of soup. Now, you can just, of course, see this as a bowl of soup and eat it and be done with it and gain nothing from this experience. But if you were to take this bowl of soup and you were to see this bowl of soup as a substitute for a work of art, because you've come into an art space expecting to see art. So therefore, that does in a way make this a work of art via the role of the curator, as we have talked about before. You can then make the connection between consuming a bowl of soup and consuming the images that you view in an art gallery. We take them, we process them and digest them. We derive mental nourishment from them. We build relationships and communities with other people, whether we share a table for eating or we connect over the ideas of art. So what it becomes is this beautiful extended metaphor made possible by the engagement of the audience. Social practice art is very focused on a community of people and the actions they take rather than any aesthetics or visual impact. Though the works are often documented, the art is considered to be happening in the course of the time spent rather than existing through the imagery. So here, Alice coordinated a large group of people in coming together to dig out and move a large sand dune or small mountain several inches. Now, when given the context of the Fujimori dictatorship that was going on in Lima, Peru, 
This work demonstrates that sometimes a massive collective effort achieves only minimal results. And what seems like a radical change in the fact that you were able to gather a group of people and take the top of that mountain and move it over a couple inches, sometimes that radical change really only winds up making little difference for people's everyday lives. Though the mountain was moved, it did little to change the surrounding environment. Though Lima changed hands of dictators several times, those changes and promises gave very little fruition to its citizens. Sometimes the art impacts the way we are meant to think about and approach art itself. By creating an artificial sun in the middle of the Tate Gallery, a prestigious art venue in London, Olafur Eliasson altered people's expectations of what a gallery space should be and therefore how they should act in it. People who would otherwise be uncomfortable with or feel discouraged from lounging in such a space reacted to the changing cues by sprawling out on the floor. And on the surface level, this is just a piece of art like any other artwork in any other art space. But because people perceived a change in their environment through this artwork, they reacted accordingly. And as the way we understand the world around us changes, artists change the way they view the environment and the role and impact humanity has on the earth. Andy Goldsworthy is a British artist that gathers, organizes, and arranges natural elements to create temporal or time-based works of art. Some pieces may last a mere minutes after being photographed, acting as a testament to the ever-changing world around us. And this drive to change and systematically develop the natural world also serves as a metaphor for humanity's impact. Cristo and Jean-Claude, who you may remember from the wrapped islands around Miami in our line lesson, are often concerned with the environment as its own entity and as a metaphor for human relationship. The Miami piece was done in conjunction with the cleanup of the bay. Here the artists wrap the trees in a Swiss park with a fabric that is traditionally used in Japan to protect the cherry trees from snows in the winter. This project actually took 32 years to come to fruition, having been rejected many times in cities before. And here's what they have to say in their own words. The temporality of a work of art creates a feeling of fragility, vulnerability, and an urgency to be seen, as well as a presence of the missing, because we know it will be gone tomorrow. The quality of love and tenderness that human beings have towards what will not last for instance, the love and tenderness we have for childhood or for our lives is a quality we want to give to our work as an additional aesthetic quality. So the temporary nature of Christo and Jean-Claude's work lends to an urgency towards thoughts of stewardship of the natural world. Because we are so interconnected now, and so many artists have studied art history across cultures and have seen the inherent biases and flaws in these histories and representations, contemporary artists often engage in what is called appropriation. Appropriation is the borrowing of any element that does not originate from the artist's mind and the reusing of that element in a more extended conversation. You could think of appropriation in terms of Andy Warhol using the Campbell's soup cans. He did not create the label for these soup cans, but he used that imagery to create a conversation about repetition, about mundaneness, about the availability of experiences thanks to industrialization and popular culture. Now, appropriation is not copying something to take credit for it, or just straight up copying something because you like it and you want one for yourself. Appropriation takes those ideas in an image that we understand because of our collective cultural knowledge and uses that image to start a dialogue. The changes that an artist does make to the image are part of the dialogue. For example, when Duchamp took a postcard of the Mona Lisa and drew a mustache on her upper lip, in that piece, Duchamp is signaling through the most popular work of art in the world that the systems of art that are already set in place are no longer worthy of being held in reverence. 
Here you can see the imagery of the original painting entitled The Swing by Fragonard. This work comes from a period of opulence, of excesses and power and privilege. It's also a very appealing, very beautiful image. So how does Yinka Shonabare, a contemporary artist, take that original image, change it, and what are those changes telling us? First, let's look at the changes. First thing he does is he makes this a 3D installation. So it's no longer a flat painting, but something that operates in space. He changes the central figure from a light-skinned woman of the Ancien Regime to a dark-skinned mannequin that has no head. And he changes the dress's fabric from traditional silk textiles to African prints. Now let's look at what those changes actually mean. Being 3D allows you to walk around the work and change your role in the story. So you can be an onlooker, take on the same role as what was originally for your view in the painting, but you could also be the person who's pushing the swing. You could be their secret lover who is hiding in the bushes. Removing the head preserves the anonymity of the figure. The audience is free to imagine whomever they wish in its place, including themselves. And changing the ethnicity of the mannequin and the origin of the fabrics alerts us to the hidden histories that made these paintings possible, though they were never addressed in the paintings themselves. Imperialism was built on the free or cheap labor of enslaved or indentured cultures, and art textbooks have been very reluctant to address these issues, which we continue to feel the ramifications of to this day. Many of Shonabari's works address the hidden effects of imperialism by appropriating the image and then changing elements of it to better reflect the underlying mechanisms of history. One of the most famous or infamous artists dealing with appropriation is Banksy. This image right here you may recognize it is pretty well known from your history books. It's called The Wreck of the Medusa. It comes from a period of art known as the Romantic period, or a period that valued high emotional stakes in paintings. The figures of this artwork, the Wreck of the Medusa, are in the same place of distress as in the original painting, hoping against all hope that their wreck will be seen by someone who passes by. However, Banksy has clearly changed one element of this beyond the medium to reinterpret the work in a contemporary message. In the original Wreck of the Medusa, the tension for you as the audience is whether or not these people will be rescued or whether they will be left adrift and never actually seen. In Banksy's work, the ship is not an 18th century wooden ship, but is a contemporary pleasure yacht. So it's very clear here that the people who are in the wreck are signaling a ship that they can see, but it's also clear that the people on the cruise yacht can see those in distress as well. And so that changes the message. Will the people who are in a sense of luxury and power and privilege respond to the calls of those who are needy, or will they not? It's no longer a question of can they even be seen, but what are the people who do see what's going on going to do about it? deeply political, widely accessible, and flouting all rules associated with good taste, Banksy and other graffiti artists challenge the accepted notions of high or fine art. Their work circumvents the gallery system and is not based on symbolism or a coding of academia. Rather, it's developed entirely from street movements. It could be done by anybody, and in fact, nobody has ever been confirmed as the artist Banksy, whose work is solely identified by a tag and who operates through a representative. Banksy as an entity is entirely anonymous. Many arts are reclaiming low arts into the fine art context today, especially in thanks to the wave of feminism. As we saw through the rise of the pattern and decoration movement, the decorative arts are coming more and more into contemporary conversation, and this includes ceramics, textiles, jewelry, paper, and other craft mediums. 
Here, artist Molly Hatch has created an installation at the entrance to the High Museum of Atlanta. The imagery she borrows comes from a pair of plates in their decorative art collection, which they keep separate from the fine arts. Her piece, however, is part of the fine arts collection and takes that pattern, scales it up, modifies it, and then proceeds to spread it over the course of 400 plates mounted on the wall. We don't normally think of plates as being associated with art, though we do think of imagery on the wall as being art. So by mixing those two expectations, the domestic nature of plates with the more fine art nature of objects on a wall, Hatch changes that relationship between dinnerware and the fine art world. And I'm going to leave you with this today. What is one issue in contemporary art that interests you? This may be something that we talked about in today's lesson, but it may be something that you see that we didn't address today, but you see artists doing. And what is an artwork, either from this class or one that you know independently, that deals with that issue in an effective manner? <music>